So the, the final panel of the day is an armchair session, which is uh, being chaired by my partner, Martin Toulouse uh, from New York. And the purpose of this session is to discuss uh, how capital is going to be raised by the industry for all the exciting things we've heard in the first uh, six hours of the day. And so uh, we'll turn it on over to Martin. Thank you, Steve. So I'm Martin Toulouse. I'm a partner at Baker Botts in New York. I'm in our finance or energy finance practice. I'm glad to be here today. Um, so we've heard about a lot of interesting topics throughout the day, uh, innovation, technology, um, the role of markets and consumer choice in the electricity market, uh, what are the changes that are needed in the, on the regulatory side, um, shifts in the utility model, um, and, and uh, various um, discussion as the rate of change um, uh, with respect to the, um, to the energy markets generally. So what we're going to try to do in this panel is uh, really two things. First, uh, we're going to try to look at, at these topics from, from the perspective of the providers of financing, debt and equity financing. Um, and so we will first try to just recap or, or get a sense from our participant as to the current state of the financing markets, both on the debt and equity, equity side for, for energy assets. And then we'll, we'll try to go back to some of the themes that we were discussing today, some of the asset classes, and get comments from the panelists on that. So with me on the panel, uh, a great a group of individuals. Uh, first to my left is Roberto Simon. Roberto is a managing director at Societe Generale in New York, um, a commercial bank. He's been a project finance or energy banker for a long time. He's been with uh, SG for more than 20 years, I believe. And he now heads the uh, energy and natural resources uh, financing function at SG um, in, in New York. To his left is uh, Gabriel Alonso. Gabriel is currently associated um, with uh, Quantum Energy Partners. And he's also executive chairman of ConnectGen. Um, but he may be uh, more well known to many of you in the audience as the former CEO of uh, EDP Renewables. He was in that position for quite some time, joined uh, that company uh, shortly before the purchase uh, by EDP of Horizon Wind and led that company through a, a long period. So it uh, can provide a, a lot of an interesting perspective from the renewables um, on a re renewables front. And finally, we have Chris Carter. Chris is managing uh, partner of NGP Energy Capital, a uh, private equity fund based in Dallas, focused primarily on the upstream oil and gas uh, sector. And Chris uh, leads the team at NGP with respect to origination of investment opportunities and also monitoring and execution of transactions. So um, to kick it off, I think I would ask Roberto to give us a sense of where we stand as of today uh, with respect to the debt uh, equity, uh, debt uh, um, markets. Uh, the, the general sense we've had over the last few years is that there was, there's been abundant liquidity in the debt markets. And, and that includes in all the various sub-segments of the debt markets that are relevant to energy assets. And by that, I mean commercial bank, uh, financing, the, the so-called term loan B, so institutional investors who, who play in the loan market, the private placement market, um, insurance companies and other similar um, investors, as well as alternative um, credit funds, which are growing in number, and many of them being focused on, on energy infrastructure. So Roberto, do you agree with that general characterization, and where do you see the market headed in, in the short term? So um, I think over the last five years, we've just seen an abundance of liquidity. Uh, every year, we see more and more liquidity coming into the system. Uh, we're seeing uh, appetite for, um, for all class of debt along ratings from non-investment grade to investment grade debt. And as Martin mentions, we're, we're also seeing probably a phenomenon over the last two or three years that is accelerating are non-traditional investors uh, coming into uh, into the market. So you know, traditionally, we've had bank uh, banks, uh, the investment grade capital markets, non-investment grade, the insurance companies. Uh, but now we're starting to see uh, funds that were, some of them developed from outshoots from private equity funds, creating debt funds. 
uh, to, to invest specifically in uh, non-liquid assets, creating even more liquidity into the system. Um, given, given the events of yesterday, I don't want to exaggerate those events too much, but I think something we've, we've all been anticipating for, for several months now uh, is uh, uh, given the growth in the U.S. economy, given the posture of the Fed, um, is a rising interest rate environment. And, and I think what, what is uh, unknown at this point is uh, how far and how fast will interest rates rise. So if, if we stay in the Goldilocks world that we've been in, they will rise just enough to make sure we keep a decent economic growth. Uh, unfortunately, experience teaches us that uh, often we don't stay in the Goldilocks world and we either go too hot or too cold. Um, so I, I think what we will see is uh, uh, what we always see is uh, the, the best projects and the lowest cost projects and the lowest cost opportunities will continue to have access to capital, both debt and equity. Uh, and and those, those opportunities that uh, uh, aren't in, in the first quartile uh, or in the top quartile will have less and less access to, uh, to capital, again, both, both debt and equity. Um, and and I think one of the things we've seen, particularly in the LNG space, is a heavy reliance on uh, bank debt uh, for construction of these large-scale infrastructure projects being taken out by, uh, by bonds. Uh, and I think uh, if we go into a recession and the high-yield market uh, experiences uh, a, a meaningful amount of stress, then, then those refinancings uh, start to become a little more difficult um, and that will put uh, more stress on, on the banks because the banks are looking to be taken out by those bond refinancings. Uh, and then that will have re repercussions through, uh, throughout the system. But um, for, for, the, for the time being and for the foreseeable future, and we'll see what happens, there, there is still uh, just uh, an amazing amount of liquidity uh, in the system for these projects. Yeah, you know, definitely seen a lot of competition amongst the lenders and other providers of debt, debt capital. So on the equity side, Chris, um, I don't know if you want to offer your perspective. My sense is that there also has been a, a growth in the number of funds dedicated for private equity or infrastructure, infrastructure funds dedicated to the sector. What, what are you seeing on, on your end? Yeah, so I would break it down into two different categories. That's absolutely true on the private equity side and infrastructure fund side. Uh, but I'll start with comments on the public equity side. And, and unlike the adequate liquidity, uh, abundant liquidity on the debt side of the business, equity markets have been more challenged uh, over the past couple of years. And, and I'll just break it down with a couple of statistics to kind of paint that picture. Uh, coming out of the downturn, all of the technology improvements that we saw that drove higher reserve recoveries, better single well returns, led to a period where there was a lot of equity issued uh, by, by public funds in 2015 and really into 2016, about $32 billion of public equity that was issued just to the oil and gas industry in that year. Uh, in 2017, that number was $7 billion, and year to date in 2018, it's been $2 billion. So why is that? Um, it's really based on poor equity performance. After all that equity was issued in 2016, um, the public oil and gas sector was down about 10% in 17. And that's a year when the S&P 500 was up about 20%. So you have 3,000 basis point underperformance by the energy sector, and portfolio managers kind of pulled the reins in and really kind of issued new uh, goals for public companies to live by, spend within cash flow. You know, a lot of the behavior in 2016 was issuing equity to pay down debt, but also to fund rapid development, where we saw the rig count in the US go from 400 to 1,000 rigs. Um, the Permian Basin was, was the leader in the pack there. Uh, but spend within cash flow was one rule. And, and also, a lot of the activity was acquiring acreage in these core basins and funding those acquisitions. Uh, so public investors have said, don't outspend cash flow on your drilling program, and let's slow down on the acquisitions of acreage and really work with the inventory that you have right now. And, and also, by the way, not only do we want you to stop issuing equity, we actually want you to start paying dividends and doing share buybacks. So it's kind of a new set of rules, and, and CEOs like Joe, uh, who is up here, Callan CEO, um, face a lot of challenges in trying to, to change the game from a focus on growth and net asset value to a focus on uh, near-term discipline and returning capital shareholders. So 
Um, I would tell you that uh, today public companies face a more challenged environment where equity markets are not as open and they really need to be more inwardly focused. So that's the public side. Switch over to the private side and it's a little bit of a different story. Um, we continue to have a lot of capital flow in from pension funds, endowments, international investors into the energy private equity sector and, and infrastructure funds are kind of a subset of that. Uh, but just in the past two years, we've seen over $30 billion of equity uh, raised by energy private equity funds. Um, don't have a perfect statistic, but I think it's safe to say that there's over $100 billion of energy private equity dry powder still today. So that portion of the equity market has become a larger uh, funder of acquisitions, of development drilling programs, uh, and that's, that's obviously where we participate. But ultimately, our exits are often to public companies. And so the, the public equity markets are a big part of that life cycle. And that, that today is still, I'd say, a subdued part of uh, the capital provider environment. Mm -hmm. So that affects behavior, of course, the, the combination of the abundant capital on the private side, but also the difficulty of planning for an exit. Absolutely. So uh, to complete our overview, I, think, I thought I would ask Gabrielle to give us a few thoughts on what's been an important component of the, um, in the source of capital for energy assets, and that's, that's the so-called tax equity market. Now that market may, is likely to become less relevant over time because that market really was designed and developed uh, to take advantage of, of the incentives under the tax code for renewable energy assets. So those incentives are expiring relatively soon. So um, Gabrielle, I don't know if you want to comment on the on the current state of that market and the potential impact of the expected changes um, over the next few years. Yeah, so the, um, the production tax credit for wind and the investment tax credit for solar, they are both expiring by 2023. Mm -hmm. Solar still keeps a permanent 10% ITC moving forward. Wind gets nothing. Uh, and while it is true that for wind, the production tax credit is phasing out, uh, so it still stays 100% of its value through the end of 2020, 80%, 2021, 60, 2022, and 40%, 2023. For solar, while there is also a phase out, the way the rules work, as long as you qualify, you start construction of your projects by the end of 2019, you have four years to complete those projects. Therefore, it's safe to say that for solar, the ITC, the investment tax credit, will stay at its highest value throughout this cycle through 2023. Mm -hmm. So there is not going to be an effective phase out of the uh, uh, solar ITC. There will be a cliff going from 30% in 2023 to 10% permanently uh, move, uh, after that. So when you look at the, uh, at the tax equity market, which has been a big source, the, the source of capital for the space, I don't think that's going to change that much moving forward because of technology evolution. So in wind, what you're seeing is that the production tax credit favors productivity. Mm -hmm. The more megawatt hours you produce, the more tax credits you, uh, pro uh, you uh, obtain, the more uh, capital you monetize upfront when you uh, uh, sell the those. Now, what the reality is that technology today uh, it's, uh, has evolved, has moved uh, so quickly in wind that you can install very tall towers with much longer blades, much more nameplate capacity in each turbine that you get to 50 to 60 percent net capacity factors in the Midwest quite easily. Mm -hmm. That's a number that you can see in Texas, West Texas, the Panhandle in Oklahoma. You can see in Kansas. You can see the Dakotas. You can see in Iowa. You can see in Minnesota. You are at north of 40 percent, between 40 to 50 percent in Illinois and Indiana, which means that today when you build a wind farm, the amount of PTC financing that uh, represents out of the original investment, it's about 70 to 80 percent, which is huge. Which means also that the amount of cash that comes out of these projects is really small. Because now a lot of the value is driven by the monetization of these tax benefits. Therefore, companies are entering into long-term offtake agreements to sell the, uh, the, the electricity for very low prices because they don't need that much. So the ability to find 
alternative ways to finance a wind farm on top of that tax equity is very complicated because there is barely any cash mm -hmm. that comes out of these uh, uh, projects. And I don't think that that situation is going to change that much in 2021 with 80% PTC or with 2022 with 60% PTC or we'll see with 40%. The jury is out because technology keeps evolving. Okay? Uh, and also, today it's very common. You won't see any project with a PPA, a long-term offtake agreement, based on a 60 or 40% uh, PTC. Uh, PTC. Offtakers, companies buying power are not buying power that far in advance. They prefer to buy power from a project that has 100% PTC and therefore can sell it cheaper. Solar is slightly different. In solar, you do see, because the ITC only represents 30%, and there is an oppos opposing effect where actually Solar upfront costs are coming down very quickly, so the effect of that 30% ITC, the impact of that is going down. It's less beneficial as time goes by. Uh, so there is a significant amount of back leverage that is happening to finance solar projects on top of tax equity. And the ITC is monetized within a couple of years versus the PTC that you need 10 years. So I would say that Right now, you're not seeing a lot of things changing in the space. Uh, uh, that tax equity is a scarce commodity, is the most scarce commodity in, in, the, in the sector. Um, uh, but it's a, it's a commodity that is needed. And the good news uh, is that they go away by 2023, and the industry will stand in its own up beyond that. So the number of players in that market and the size of that market hasn't changed? or. No the, 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 no, the numbers of players hasn't changed. Uh, uh, there were, let me take that step back, there were a couple of unusual suspects that entered that space, like Google, mm -hmm. uh, Apple, and Facebook, but uh, that was, has not been a recurrent uh, 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 reality. I mean, the insurance companies, the, the financial entities, the banks that were active a few years ago, they are still very active. But it is also true that the there is a still demand for both, for PTC and ITC finance, because not all of them tackle the same type of equity demand. Those that have visibility on their tax base over the next few years, just in the next few years, will prefer ITC, because it takes shorter term to monetize. Those that have a longer view on their tax base will prefer PTCs, because it doesn't eat as much of their tax base immediately. It takes 10 years to do that. Roberto, any thoughts on, on that segment of the market? I know you, you provide back leverage and other types of financing around these assets. No, I, I, I would agree in general terms with Gabriel. I think the challenge, um, and it's going to be a theme, uh, and I think we heard a little bit in, on the last panel when I, I took note, you know, it's technology, integration, and scale. And scales would kind of, and I, and I would add cost of capital to, as the fourth, as, uh, as uh, uh, elements required for success. And uh, as the sub tax subsidies roll off, as we get less, uh, less cash flow, I, I think what, uh, what everyone's struggling with, and we see it now, uh, power purchase agreements are going away, or we're going to away from utilities on power purchase agreements. They're, they're becoming shorter. We're seeing uh, agreements with commercial entities, and, and obviously that changes the dynamic, because when I was a kid, if someone said, you know, Sears was going to go bust 20 years, 30 years, 40 years later, I won't say exactly how old I am, but Sears was around when I was a kid, uh, you know, who, who knew? Uh, so who knows what companies are going to be around 20, 30 years from now, especially now with, uh, with the rate of technological change. And as the gas industry on the international side from LNG looks to basically price U.S. gas and Australian gas at, at an international benchmark, we're moving away from point-to-point -point type contracts. Uh, and again, you're, you're seeing more volatility in cash flows. And, and I think, uh, to Chris's point a little bit, is uh, I, at some point, there's, there's only a couple of ways to get your required rate of return. Either you have an exit multiple that works for you, or, or you try and lever the bejesus out of your asset. Um, but, but the trend is to, to bring leverage down for these assets because we have less predictability of cash flow. So I, I, I think there's going to be um, a, 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 a stress in the system until we adapt to the new world. And equity investors adjust that they may be having lower rates of return than they were previously expecting in this asset class. And, uh, and the, 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 the lending markets kind of across uh, 
uh, across the spectrum of lenders uh, adapt to new lending models because the, the, the lending models we're accustomed to were for a different time in a different place where we had very predictable cash flows. And that just, that just yeah. it's, it, it still exists, but it's, it's existing, uh, it, it's diminishing. Yeah, I mean, it's certainly the case that the historical traditional project financing single asset was based on long-term contracts with investment grade counterparties, and that's more and more difficult to obtain. You, I think you missed the prior panel that Steve led, but there was some discussion on the LNG SPA, SPAs changing and potentially being shorter term. Um, that also is potentially a, a challenge for financing. How would you view those developments? Uh, is the answer also just reducing leverage, or how? Well, I think you'll see the introduction. Yeah, definitely less leverage. If, if I don't know what the, if I need to take, if I as a lender need to take, and no matter who the class of lender is, has to take a view as to where prices are going to be after the expiration of the contract, that's an unknown element. And if you look at, uh, at companies that are exposed to price risk, they're not levered at 70, 80%, which is what projects with, with, uh, with, with uh, very predictable cash flows or contracts are levered. They're levered 40, 50, utilities at 60%. So um, yeah, we'll see less leverage. Uh, you'll probably see as, uh, as uh, the markets take some amount of price risk, uh, you'll see cash sweeps. Mm -hmm. So both debt and equity can benefit from from spikes in uh, in prices, uh, so that that can 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 get out uh, a little quicker than anticipated, for the, a little sooner than maturity. So the markets will adapt, but but I think the the, the two key elements for me um, are going to be less leverage, and uh, I, I think there's going to be a much greater focus on um, on cost competitiveness, which is what we see in every industry that's a commodity industry. And you know, as renewables look to be more commodity-like, and we see that in Latin America already, as LNG becomes a more global commodity like oil, you better be a low-cost producer. Otherwise, you're going to have difficulty attracting capital. OK. Let's go back to the prior panel and, and the Permian and developments there, and maybe developments more generally uh, within the upstream uh, and the midstream sector in particular. There seems to be a need for a lot of additional infrastructure. And I think, as you alluded to, Chris, in your initial comments, the equity markets have been difficult. And that's been true, especially for MLPs, which historically have been a significant source of funding for, for midstream assets. So how do you see the, the funding model for those types of assets changing in light of you know, current conditions? Yeah, I mean, first of all, it's, it's a huge opportunity and just the volume growth that we're seeing, not just in the Permian, but in, in the U.S. today, we're the world's largest oil producer. That, that happened in the past year. If you go back to 2010, we were producing about 5.5 million barrels per day, and today we're around 11. Most of that growth is coming from relatively few basins, the Scoop Stack merge in Oklahoma, the Bakken is growing again, the Eagleford in South Texas, the DJ Basin uh, in Colorado, although political uh, challenges there, and then the Permian, which has gone from about two to three and a half million barrels per day in, in the past two-ish years. So it, it's a good problem to have that we have these infra infrastructure constraints. It's because of the underlying quality of the rock and the high returns that companies are generating. But it is a problem. And we've seen in the Permian oil price differentials widen out to as high as $20 per barrel. They're starting to come in now due to some of these infrastructure projects coming online. But taking a step back, uh, we expect that the industry will spend about $70 billion in 2018 on midstream infrastructure. That number in 2019 will grow to close to $90 billion. And I think the shift is more of that is being funded by private equity for some of the reasons that I mentioned before. Uh, the returns are there, the opportunity is there, and the MLP sector right now is kind of reinventing itself as uh, MLPs that had IDR structures and in some cases publicly traded GPs are now converting to C-Corps. And, and that uh, will help them fund a lot of these projects. But uh, in, the, in the period of time we're in right now, private equity is stepping in and funding not just gathering and processing projects, but um, in increasingly funding some of these long-haul pipelines going from the Permian Basin to Houston or Corpus Christi. Uh, so I, I think you'll continue to see dollars flow to those opportunities, and, and ultimately price differentials will come in. 
um, and really just reflect the transportation cost of getting a barrel from the Permian to the Gulf Coast. But I think that's, that's one of the really interesting trends right now in our industry is, you know, we've always talked about Cushing, Oklahoma, and WTI, and that's where oil barrels are priced. But I think increasingly in the future, what's really relevant is what's the price of oil in Corpus Christi or Houston? Because ultimately, as was discussed on the previous panel, we've gone from zero to three million barrels per day of crude oil exports in the past two years. And it, it's reasonable to assume that every incremental barrel that gets produced in the Permian or any of these other high growth oil basins, is, its ultimate destination is the water. Um, so that, that's a big part of the infrastructure right now um, and a pretty dynamic uh, part of our industry. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Talking about water, maybe a different kind. Do you see the investment opportunity also in water treatment, as was as was suggested in in prior panel? We do. Um, we have a, a company that focuses on transportation and uh, disposal of, of flowback water. Um, it's a big area, as discussed on the previous panel. Uh, you need to to ultimately dispose of the produced water and source fresh water for fracks. Um, I think from an investment perspective, one of the challenges you have to deal with is uh, there aren't a lot of barriers to entry. Um, you see a lot of uh, private individuals pooling money together to drill a saltwater disposal well, so you don't have the same barriers that you would with a large long haul pipeline or a gas processing plant. Um, the other thing is, is companies like Callan or Shell can choose to drill their own saltwater disposal wells, or they can say, you know what, we want to recycle because that's more cost effective or, or uh, uh, better for the environment. So I think there's some challenges, but there's clearly a lot of capital going to the, into that sector right now. Okay. Just staying with, with Chris for a second, and maybe it's just a subset of the prior question, but we one structure we'd seen used a lot uh, to fund developments in the Permian and elsewhere were, were these so-called drilled coves. Do you, do you expect to see more of those, or, or do, is the model changing in any way for, for that? Yeah, it's a good question. So I, I'll, first I'll explain for, for those that aren't familiar what a drill co is. And, and this was really a funding structure that came out of the downturn, where companies had limited debt capacity, the equity capital markets were closed, and a lot of companies had really good drilling inventory, but they really didn't have funding for it. So some debt providers created this structure where essentially it's a project financing on a limited number of wells. So if you're an oil and gas company in the Permian Basin and you have 1,000 drilling locations that you could drill, you can take 10 or 20 of those, go to this drill co-provider and say, you provide 90% of the capital to drill the wells and you get all of the cash flows until you earn, call it a 12 or 13% rate of return. And then I, as the operator, get 80 or 90% of the cash flows after that. The difference between that and traditional debt funding is if your wells are over budget or if you only produce half the oil you expected and you can't return all of the capital, the drill co-provider is taking kind of equity risk alongside you. So for a private equity firm that has portfolio companies, it's, it's an attractive alternative to diluting the company with more equity or taking the risk of adding more debt. Um, so we've used it once in one of our portfolio companies. And uh, like a lot of financial markets, uh, that opportunity uh, was attractive initially. More capital flowed in, and the terms have become better um, in a lot of cases for oil and gas companies. And in the high level of, of the deal that we did, our company gets a 35% working interest in the wells that they drill on this package, and they're only putting up 15% of the capital. Um, there's a 12%, 12-ish percent rate of return threshold, and after that, we get roughly 80% of the economics back. Um, so we think it's an attractive way to help accelerate growth, with, again, without the impact of dilution um, or the risk of debt. And, and I think you know, today there are 10 to 15 capital providers that are in that market. Um, and my sense is they and their investors think it's a very attractive source of capital because they don't have to pay for the acreage. So they're taking drilling risk, but they're not paying all the mm -hmm. upfront capital to acquire the acreage that the oil and gas company is. Right. Yeah. Um, okay, so just let's go back to renewables and and power, and um, hit on a theme that was discussed earlier uh, today, and that is energy storage. And there's a lot of excitement around that, a lot of investment in the sector, um, potentially disruptive in many ways, and you know will will have impacts both on um, you know on various elements of of the of the value value chain. But so far, there really have been 
few projects that have been financed um, on a standalone basis, storage projects. And there's a lot of talk about uh, solar plus storage or wind plus uh, storage. And, and you know, some of these projects have been successfully bidding. But again, not that many yet uh, fully financed. So I'd like to get the panelists' thoughts, maybe starting with Gabriel, but also interested in Roberto's thoughts on, on that. Um, what are the main challenges you see relating to these types of assets? and really capturing the full value of these, of these assets? And do we need a change in the pricing mechanisms around those assets to really capture that value? So uh, I would say that, like with any new technology, uh, technology is a risk as to uh, how uh, storage will feed into the uh, industry and which technology will win this race. Uh, we saw that in solar uh, many years ago between solar thermal and PV. Uh, we saw it in wind between stall and, and pitching technologies. So key question is to one would wonder which technology will win and if there is going to be just a single technology that uh, will be winning uh, because there are different ways one can monetize storage and, and therefore there may, be, there may be opportunities for different technologies. I would point from a financing standpoint, uh, from a financing standpoint of view, uh, I would identify warranties as something that is worth paying attention to, uh, uh, because aligning or lining up the warranties in a in a new uh, battery with the different ways that battery can operate and provide revenues is something that is I don't think people are paying enough attention to. Correct? We were looking at a project uh, uh, in the Southwest. Uh, we were, when we were looking at the product that that project had contracted for, we saw that it was an ener a bulk energy sifting product for early in the mornings, late in the uh, evenings, and then providing ancillary services throughout uh, uh, the day. But then we started digging into the warranty, and we saw that there were a lot of constraints to operate the uh, facility that way, uh, that you could void the warranty. For example, if you were cycling more than once, several more than X days uh, a week, uh, or that you had to have a minimum uh, average state uh, charge uh, for the, for the uh, battery in order to keep the warranty. So I would identify as the al uh, aligning the commercial structure of the uh, uh, of the uh, project with the warranty of that uh, battery solution as something that it ha you have to pay a lot of attention to from a financing standpoint of view. When you look at renewals plus storage, I think that's that's a re something that's happening. So the solar ITC can can be used for uh, uh, storage uh, as long as that storage supports the solar facility. But that is also something that creates its limitations because you have to make sure that that storage solution that is attached to the solar facility is there to support the solar project and is not treated as a standalone mm. battery solution, at least during the first five years, if you want to avoid a clawback, uh, uh, a recapture situation with, with, the, uh, with the IRS. Uh, and in terms of uh, uh, revenue, I mean, solutions that would make this a much more attractive uh, 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 investment, I would say flexible warranties, going back to my comment before, warranties where there is uh, the ability to adjust uh, 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 the warranty and the cost of that warranty to the different sources of revenues, the different mm -hmm. ways that one can operate that uh, a, a, a battery. I would say long-term uh, revenue solutions. Uh, it's very difficult to find toll, long-term tolling agreements in this uh, market. Massachusetts, New York are going that way, but it's awfully complicated. And a third opportunity is uh, uh, FERC has already moved in this direction, acknowledging that a storage should be or could be treated as a transmission asset for rate purposes. So uh, I think a storage could find long-term revenue opportunities if viewed as a transmission and distribution deferral asset, and that can certainly open up the, a lot of opportunities for uh, uh, transmission for battery uh, uh, applications as a uh, standalone application. Mm -hmm. I, mean, I, I, I would just add. Um, so renewables and storage have been 
tied together for a long time because we've seen pump storage with, right. with hydro, obviously, and, and I think uh, solar and, and batteries is, is analogous. It's, it's, it's a wonderful combination. Um, you know, there's, like in most things that are new, there's a lot of excitement. Um, completely echo Gabriel's comments on, on technology and the warranties and performance, and that's something we focused on on a few of the projects we've seen. Um, and, and we've seen application of these projects in very high cost environments. So I think we're looking at a couple projects in Hawaii, we're looking at a couple projects in, in Chile. Uh, but for the most part, uh, where we've seen them adapted, uh, it's either very high cost environments or the state, uh, as in the, a state in, within the United States, uh, has decided to subsidize the technology because they want to help its development. Um, so. Uh, you know, I, I think we were talking at dinner last night, uh, and, and I know it's not utility scale, but uh, you know, I live in northern New Jersey. We have a lot of trees. Every time there's a storm, uh, I live at the end of a street. Electricity goes out. When Sandy hit, you know, I had no electricity for two weeks. Uh, so I was in the mall, went into the Tesla. I, I guess you can't call them showrooms because they're not technically legally showrooms, the, the, the Tesla room. And the guy shows me a battery pack, and uh, I said, wow, it's, what is that? It's a battery pack. It's fantastic. Um, how much does it cost? This is $15,000. I said, how, man, how, how many hours of uh, storage does it give me? Eight. I, I can install a Generac gas-fired generator uh, for $15,000. That's purchase of the Generac unit and installation, which will power my house 24-7. Uh, until either gas runs out or my electricity comes back on. So, um, and I don't think utility scale is too different. Uh, I'm sure it's much more cost effective, but until uh, you know, technolog technology continues to advance, and I'm sure it will, because now there's money and focus on batteries, I, I, I think it's, it's gonna be, we're gonna see a lot of excitement, but not many projects mm -hmm. uh, at, at the end of the day. Yeah, definitely a lot of talk and excitement. Yeah. But, uh, yeah. Um, yeah, staying with storage and, and, and touching on one of also the, one of the panels, the earlier panels today, um, another model which was being discussed by John Berger at Sonova is, is residential solar coupled uh, with, so, with storage. And um, Roberto, I wanted to ask your, your thoughts generally on, on the financing model for residential storage. One trend we've been, we've been um, Seeing is is the use of structured finance techniques to 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 deal with um, uh, pools of residential solar assets. So essentially, combining traditional securitization techniques and structured finance uh, with with uh, energy financing. And um, just wondering whether that is the best way, or are there other ways to finance these types of assets? It's an evolving market. There's, there's, I think, continued innovation in that market. So we we'll probably haven't seen the last of it. But mm -hmm. I don't know what your reaction is at this point. Yeah. So I think the difficulty with uh, using a securitization technique in, uh, in distributed solar is when, when you've seen securitization effectively used, it's in relatively established markets. Right. So, so credit cards, automobiles, your, your, you know, automobile loans, and so on. So you're, you're seeing. Um, a technique to take these loans off the balance sheets of banks and, and, and basically distribute them widely into the capital markets, which is a much deeper market. Um, and, and the reason they work is because you have a, a very, very broad-based uh, set of assets, uh, both regionally, uh, uh, credit quality, and you can kind of gauge what, uh, what your default rate might be and what your prepayment rate might be, and so the investors can get a sense of what their, their instrument's gonna look like. What we've seen to date in securitization for distributed generation, distributed solar, uh, rooftop solar, is it's a relatively small market. Um, it's relatively concentrated in certain areas, so you don't get the diversity. Um, and the, the, the companies that are doing this, um, are, are using it as a technique to basically free up liquidity. So it's not to free up liquidity from a bank's balance sheet, it's to try and generate liquidity for the company. And uh, you know, the two companies that, that, well I won't mention them, the two companies that have been most active, um, they, they struggle with their basic business model, which is to generate enough receivables in effect. You know, enough people putting panels on the rooftops 
uh, under contracts, and uh, you know, de demand for those is driven really by, by three things, two to three things. So, so the first is subsidies for the state. So the state's going to pay you to put up the panels on your roof. Otherwise, it's really not cost effective. Um, the, the, the second is um, you know, some sense of reliability. And, um, and then the third is uh, that the, uh, the utility is going to pay you for, for uh, every megawatt or kilowatt hour that you produce, which is really where your return comes as, as an owner of these. Um, and it's hard to attract enough people to do that. So what you've seen is very small scale private placement securitizations. Um, and until the industry can scale up and get a much broader base of receivables that they can then go securitize, I see it uh, as, as something that's ongoing, but pretty much a cottage industry mm -hmm. with respect to using that as a financing technique. Okay. Um, I want to touch on another topic that was, that was also mentioned earlier in some of the other panels, and that's electric vehicles um, as being a potential um, uh, innovation in the energy sector. Um, I think people have different views as to how quickly and how realistic um, the move to, uh, to electric vehicles will, will happen. But if it does, any, any kind of meaningful increase in the number of electric vehicles would have a significant impact on the, on the power sector, creating additional demand, of course. Uh, would it have an impact on the upstream oil and gas sector? Would give some opportunity for on the power side to to come up with creative pricing to encourage behavior with respect to to charging, and would also presumably require a significant amount of infrastructure for recharging. Um, so, Chris, I'm, I'm wondering what your thoughts are on on this trend, and you know whether that factors into your investment decisions at this point from the perspective of a, of an oil and gas focused PE fund. Um, Yes, okay. so I, I admittedly have a little bit of a biased perspective on this topic. But as you can imagine, when we're meeting with our investors, it's very topical. And, and really, it's topical because investors want to understand when are we going to see peak oil demand. You know, we've had, over the last 20 years, one to two million barrels per day per year of oil demand growth. Other than really 2009, 2010, it's been as steady as she goes. So that's the big question. With continued adoption of EVs, when are we going to see that growth level off and then potentially ultimately decline? Um, so I, I'm admittedly not an expert on the topic of electric vehicles, but certainly we've done a lot of study on it to try and understand and educate our own investors that are asking those questions. And, and I always like to start you know, first with the premise that adoption of EVs is real. It's a real phenomenon. It's going to continue, and it's going to continue rapidly. Uh, but it's also important to put things in perspective in terms of what the numbers we're starting from. So today, uh, globally, there are about 5 million electric vehicles on the road. Um, globally today, there are 1.2 billion combustion engine vehicles, so very different scale. Um, according to Goldman Sachs, by 2030, we'll see EVs grow from 5 million to 83 million vehicles. Um, so rapid adoption. Uh, but also, by 2030, we're likely to add about a billion people to the global population. So uh, most reports that we look at still estimate that the number of combustion engine vehicles over that period of time will grow by about 300 million to 1.5 billion in total. So the, the overall impact on oil demand over that period of time is we still expect to see oil demand growth of a little over 10 million barrels per day by 2030. I think when you go beyond 2030, it becomes much more difficult to predict. Um, but that's, that's our general sense. And I think the other thing that's important to keep in mind as it applies to the oil and gas sector is that one to two million barrels per day of demand growth that we see every year really is not the big driver on why we have to spend so much capital in this industry. It's the fact that out of roughly 100 million barrels per day that we produce globally, we lose about 6 million barrels per day every year just from natural supply declines. So yeah, there's 1 to 2 million barrels per day of growth, but it's 6 of, of uh, production declines that we need to replace every year. So I, I think it, it's a worthy debate of what year we'll see peak oil demand. I think that will happen at some point in the next 20 years. Uh, but I don't think that's uh, the near-term end of this industry. Um, it's a, a very slow, gradual move on a very, very large industry. 
Yeah, Real, do you have any thoughts on, on that? From, from your I, I agree. Uh, I think that this is coming. I think I would think that uh, when I look at the electrical vehicle, the EV market, I think of the wild, wild east rather than the wild, wild west, because I think China is going to take the lead on this, is taking the lead on this, and they are going to be the ones. I was in London last week, and there was this uh, graph showing, the, I don't even remember the name of this Chinese city, which was not a known one, because I cannot even remember the name. And that city alone had more electric buses than the top five largest cities in Europe. Buses, that the top five cities in Europe have buses, period. Mm -hmm. So China is moving at quite rapid. It's going to move faster than others. I think that uh, 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 adoption rate could be more rapid from a from people consumer standpoint of view, but here there is, uh, uh, this is where capitalism works, correct? When you look at these, uh, the, the incumbents, the, uh, the traditional uh, internal combustion engine manufacturers, their margins are coming from the traditional ICE, correct? It's not coming from the electric vehicles. That's part of their, their proposal, what they're offering, but they don't make any money with this car. So transitioning to from a money-making product to a non-money-making product, which will eventually provide them with the margins they need, but I mean, transitioning through the desert, that how, as a CEO, do you explain that to your board? I mean, it's quite interesting to me how that's going to happen. You have to respond to the signals from the market, but you have to manage that response because your, your numbers as a company are not going to look well for many years as you transition from one product to the other, which you can. I mean, the, I mean a company that is manufacturing all these, uh, these companies are manufacturing the same piece of equipment they will have to manufacture is slightly different, but that difference is, is, makes a big a big impact into their bottom line. Mm -hmm. So I, I would in, invite uh, members of the audience to ask questions if they have any. Um, we can continue the discussion, but I want to leave a little bit of time uh, for those questions. Uh, yes. Sir. Well, thank you very much for your insights into pricing. Um, I trade on the global markets, um, specifically commodities. Um, so one of my questions is, we're talking about crude oil and oil you know, being a big player for the near future, at least 10 years. Um, I'm really puzzled when I look at the financing of these MLPs. Typically, when I hear from these partners is they assume the price of oil is going to be about 20% less than what it is trading today at. Um, it seems a very crude approximation. Um, and I've heard from several MLP players, that's how they typically finance it. But we do financial modeling, and we can we trade on crude oil pricing every day. Um, so after having seen this boom of $100 and it's crashing to 30 and now back to 70, we know it's going to happen. It can be predicted. We trade on it. Um, so why don't these MLPs actually use more sophisticated financial models for a more um, hedged uh, risk exposure? I'm just puzzled. So maybe if you can share some insights into um, how uh, they're budgeting the price of oil. So I, I can't speak specifically for any MLPs, but I, I think in our experience, uh, the forward curve is kind of the best ind indicator of where money is changing hands every day, where oil and gas companies are hedging. But historically, it's been a very poor predictor of what the actual future price of oil or natural gas will be. It's the best thing we have. So I, I can tell you when we make investment decisions, we're using that as one case to predict future cash flows, and then we're running sensitivities and, and typically running more conservative sensitivities. You know, my guess is a 20% uh, decrease in a model might be just looking at the forward curve right now, where today the price of oil is around $73 per barrel, but if you go out to 2020 uh, or 2022, it's closer to 60. So that's just where the market is today. Um, and I think it, it's pretty bold for anyone to, to be using a $75 flat case, but um, being in this business for a long time, I think you develop a real sense of humility that it's very difficult for anybody to accurately predict where prices will be. So uh, being cautious and making sure you're funding a business that can work in a variety of price environments, I think, is, is one of the approaches that we use uh, just to make sure that we can hit return targets in an uncertain world. Anything else from the panel? Yeah, listen, I, I, I would add, um, 
I, I don't think there were a whole lot of people that actually caught the, the, the downdraft from 70 to, to 30. And there were probably a few hedge funds that did. So, so I think the, in the traders we do business with, and, and we bank all the largest traders in the world, uh, I think are, are uh, extremely sophisticated and extremely efficient at, at short-term price movements. Um, but I, I think that's a, v and, and, and if, you, if you look at the business model for those traders, they don't want to own the assets, right? They don't want to be drilling wells. They don't want to own infrastructure. They simply want to take, take advantage of short-term movements in, in the price of the commodity. Uh, while those that are putting the infrastructure in place are inherently making long-term bets. And, and it's very difficult to, produce the future, uh, to predict the future. I, I, it, it, it's just inherently, it's, it's in, because what drives the price of oil or any commodity up or down is, is not going to be just uh, the, the forecast of, of, of demand and supply, which is virtually impossible to predict, uh, at least in my opinion. It, it's usually an exogenous factor. Right. Uh, and it can also be, and, and it can be either economic, uh, it can be regulatory, it can be sanctions, you just never know. So I think it's, it's difficult for, um, for companies creating long-term infrastructure to, to really manage. They have to manage their balance sheets, in a, as Chris says, in, a, in, a, in as prudent a manner as they can and run sensitivities that uh, gives them some comfort. But, you just never know. Thank you. Uh, uh, George Frank. Um, to, uh, to just to help the panel a little bit, the comments you guys made about the uh, renewables trying to make the project sanction financing decision, I think the comparison is when you have for midstream assets pipelines where the pipeline or companies basically a toll road and you can extrapolate the revenues you're going to get from a toll road infinitely so far the curse uh, you cross your meet your hurdle requirement so you can make that decision but for like you said for the uh, renewables it's difficult to predict how you're going to toll it so until you get that tolling feature into renewables you're probably not going to be you're going to not really make a, a financing decision unless you get some kind of guarantees, which are subsidies from the government. But my question proper is, looking at the financial models which private equity companies have now, how do you see this changing or staying static going forward, maybe say 10, 20 years from now? In terms of financing for, you mean for storage projects or renewable energy projects? No, for energy projects generally? Again, if I, let me talk about renewable energy projects. I think that uh, financing, I agree with uh, what Roberto was saying, financing will get more complex in the renewable energy space just because we are getting into a different environment where the counterparties of the contracts that are buying power from renewable energy projects, shifting from the utilities, the traditional utilities, to more corporations. Even Exxon is out there in the market right now uh, buying, uh, trying to buy wind. So that's a big change because there, these contracts are different from the utility uh, contracts. The utilities own the transmission assets, so they are willing to go all the way to your project location to buy the output, the power, the electricity from your project. These corporations do not own any transmission assets. They are willing to buy your electricity from liquid hubs, where they are more protected from uh, uh, spikes in, in, in electricity driven by transmission constraints. That means more risks into the uh, owner of the uh, wind or solar uh, facility. And the contracts are going to get more and more sophisticated as time goes by. So uh, just my comment to you would be that the amount of financing that will come out of these assets is not going to be as high as it is today driven by the, the monetization of the production tax credit because the complexities uh, and the risks that are getting shifted to the owner of the facility are going to be much bigger as time goes by than they have been in the past. Thank you. So I think we have time for maybe two more questions. So the, uh, Andrew Barrett, I work for an E&P company downtown. Um, thanks for the great panel. Questions about private oil and gas private equity returns over the past decade or two. Obviously, the space has gotten much more crowded, both in number of firms and assets. 
under management. I wonder if that means very directly that returns have come down. Have your NGP's returns sort of eroded at the margin? And then what can we expect sort of going forward? Obviously, the, the very big firms like KKR and Apollo have come in sort of later than folks like yourself. But um, should we expect the public equity markets have not performed well? Should we expect that private equity firms who all sort of like to talk about being in the top quartile or quintile are really going to have a mi mixed results um, given the assets in the space? Yeah, I, I think certainly more capital coming in is one factor, but my observation uh, is a lot of that happened kind of ten, five and ten years ago, and I expect that the total amount of energy private equity will actually decrease a little bit going forward. Um, a lot of it has to do with the vintage in which each fund was invested. And we, we all have vintages where we invested capital leading up to the downturn. And as you can imagine, if, if you invested a lot of capital right before oil prices went from the mid-90s down to the 20s and um, up to where we are right now, those are tougher vintages. I, I think a lot of the capital that's been invested over the past two or three years is likely to produce really good returns. Our job, uh, as I see it, is to produce adequate returns in really tough environments when prices go down and to produce outstanding returns when you have a little bit more wind at your back and at, over a long period of time uh, deliver attractive IRRs to our investors. But I think vintage does matter. Uh, we like to say we're not correlated to changes in commodity prices because all of our funds have been positive returns. But if you look at those vintages, there's certainly an influence over those price changes. Um, as far as different capital coming in, I think you know, different investors have a different focus. You have US-focused uh, investors that are really looking at oil and gas and midstream. Some of the firms in New York that you mentioned are looking globally. They're looking at renewables. They're looking at power. Uh, so you're going to have different return profiles based on, on where that focus is. Uh, but again, I, I don't think additional capital coming into the se sector right now is going to be a big headwind. I think we've seen a lot, a lot of that already take place. Thank you. So one last question. Rick Massey. Uh, recently, I saw a presentation that showed the growth of uh, oil demand that was basically a straight line up no matter what the oil price was. When it was $20, 20-something, versus it didn't fall, it didn't gain. And when it was 110, it didn't go up or down. It just stayed straight. Now, do you guys look at, at those kind of graphs or those kind of that kind of information or are you just basically trying to peg it based on your own experience of where oil is and maybe the break even price on any particular well that uh, you're financing yeah I, I would say that historically oil demand has been relatively inelastic to changes in commodity prices but you see a little bit of the impact and, and for instance you know, the recession in 2008, 2009 was really the one period where oil demand reduced, uh, decreased a little bit. In the last two years, we've seen higher oil demand than average, but it's 1.8 million barrels per day per year instead of 1.2. And I think part of that is oil prices uh, being lower in 2015 and 16, creating a little bit more demand. But my overall observation is you don't see a huge impact uh, based on the price of oil on oil demand. Yeah, and I would say from, from the debt side, um, we do take a view as to price and, and have various sources to, to help us take that view. But I'd say we're much more focused on the cost side, right? Because uh, when we saw the price of oil come down in the last downturn, uh, a lot of companies uh, ended up in trouble because their cost of production was too high and they had too much debt. So we're very focused on what the capital structure looks like and, and what your cost of production is. Okay, well, please join me in thanking our panelists for this very interesting discussion.